Hello and welcome to Sophie Ridge on Sunday. It's a particularly poignant Remembrance Sunday this year, the first led by King Charles after the death of his mother, with the nation preparing to fall silent at 11 o'clock. But before that, we're going to focus on a critical week in Westminster, because in just four days' time, Jeremy Hunt will deliver what is a budget in all but name. It's likely to define his time as Chancellor and the Conservative hopes at the next election. But more importantly, it will affect all of us and an economy that's probably already in recession. Now, we know there will be tax rises when incomes are already squeezed and spending cuts when public services are already struggling. And that is a very difficult message to deliver. We'll look at the task ahead with our guests this morning. Well, in a moment, uh, we'll be talking to the Chancellor himself, Jeremy Hunt. And we'll be talking to his opposite number for Labour, the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reid, on the programme this morning. Plus Simon Clark, the former levelling up secretary under Liz Truss, will give us his first interview since leaving government. And with spending cuts on the agenda and more strikes to come, we'll talk to Christina McEnay, the general secretary of the Union Unison. Plus, on Remembrance Day, the Chief of the Defence Staff, Admiral Sir Tony Radekin, has been speaking to our Defence and Security Editor, Deborah Haynes. Good morning. Well, he's just a few weeks into the job and Thursday's autumn statement could already be career-defining for the new Chancellor. Well, Jeremy Hunt uh, has uh, been on the show uh, already uh, this morning. He's repeatedly uh, told us that there will be eye-wateringly difficult decisions made on spending cuts and tax rises. With the UK likely already in recession, we spoke to uh, Jeremy Hunt about his plans for the economy. Before we get to the uh, autumn statement, how will you be reflecting this Remembrance Sunday? Well, I'm going to be remembering my father who died eight years ago and was in the Navy all his life. And I'll be thinking about him. Um, but also, I think all of us will be thinking about the brave Ukrainians who have been on the front line fighting for freedom, not just for them, but actually for all of us. And I think it's a reminder that we can never be complacent if we want to defend the things we really believe in. Uh, is defence spending something that you're going to be prioritising next week, then? It's really important. Um, I will be talking about it. Uh, there are lots of things we need to resolve when it comes to defence spending. But if you're asking, is the Prime Minister, am I committed to making sure that we can defend our country and the values we believe in? Absolutely, yes. Uh, now, I do want to um, talk about what we can expect next week. Um, and I want to do things a bit differently because I know, obviously, with these interviews, you're very limited in what you can say. So rather than just running through a whole load of potential policies and you saying to me, I can't talk about them, um, I'm going to try and keep things a bit more broad. And if you could answer things as fully as you're able, given, obviously, the, the concern that so many of our viewers are, frankly, having at the minute with the inflation costs and, and, and potential austerity uh, to come as well. Um, You've warned of decisions of eye-watering difficulty. Does this mean we are going to be seeing a return to austerity? Well, they are going to be very difficult decisions, but we are a resilient country and we've faced much bigger challenges, frankly, in our history. And we know that to deal with problems, you have to face into them, not run away from them. And we're also a compassionate country. And so the plan that I outlined to the House of Commons on Thursday will be one that gets us through these difficult times, but also shows that British compassion, the support for the most vulnerable people, and probably the single thing that is the biggest worry to people on low incomes, actually to everyone, is the rising cost of bills, energy prices going up. And so we will outline a plan to hold down the rises in energy prices and chart our way to a, a longer-term world in which we're not dependent on what uh, Putin does. He can't just suddenly see our gas prices shoot up. Having that long-term plan in place is, I think, the way that we can give people confidence that we'll get through this. So will there be a new plan on energy? Because you're warning, aren't you, uh, in the Sunday Times uh, today about the uh, sustainability uh, of the current plan and the, the amount it's costing us? Well, we face a global energy crisis. Uh, 
The increase in our national energy bill over the last couple of years is about £140 billion. It's like the economy supporting an entire second NHS. And if we're going to tackle that and deal with the worry that, for example, a pensioner has about the you know, massive increase in, in the gas bill, the electricity bill and so on, then we need a long-term plan for the country for clean energy, for green energy, for cheap energy, uh, that isn't affected by international events. So, absolutely, I'll be setting out that plan on Thursday. Um, you talk about pensioners. Is it likely that support could be more targeted to people who are more vulnerable? Well, we want to support people who need support. We, we don't want anyone not to be able to afford to heat their home over this winter or, indeed, future winters. Uh, but in the long run, what you need is a plan that means that we don't need to have to give very, very expensive support as taxpayers because we've got an energy system that works better, that, that deals with uh, what dictators are doing in other parts of the world. It means that we're not suddenly vulnerable to, to big changes in international gas prices. So I want to outline the short-term support that we'll give people who need it, but also a long-term plan to really change our approach to energy. Um, now, there's been reports of a £55 billion black hole uh, in the public finances that you want to try and shrink with a mixture of, sort of tax rises and spending cuts. I is that correct? Well, we do have to um, do some tax rises, do some spending cuts, if we're going to show that we're a country that pays our way. And, and the reason for that is, is very simple. You know, we were able to help businesses through the furlough scheme, uh, we've been able to help people with their energy bills this winter. We'll be able to do so next winter because we've been responsible with public finances. Uh, we're now in a situation where the world has changed very dramatically over the last year. But the plan that we'll outline will help us get through this in a way that I, I want to make sure that this recession, if we're in a recession, is as short and shallow as possible and get through to the economy growing healthily the other side. And, and that's the plan that I think will give people confidence. And that's what I want to announce to the House of Commons. You, you say that you've been responsible with the public finances. I, I just want to question if that's actually true. Um, I think we can look at uh, debt uh, over time, debt levels. And obviously, I take your point that I'm sure you'll say uh, that, you know, COVID ha has come along uh, and that has affected things. But actually, the increase in debt started before that. Uh, you can see here, you know, it's starting to go up from around you know, 2008 to 2009, and government debt as a percentage of the economy has been high for some time. Some people will be saying, hang on, the Conservatives have been in power for 12 years. You're the ones who have actually effectively trashed the economy and got it into the state we're in now. Well, we've had some very big shocks, as you mentioned, a uh, once-in-a-century pandemic now the situation in Ukraine. And, and you'll find all countries all over the world have seen their debt levels increase. In fact, our debt level is lower than many other countries, many other big countries across the world. Uh, but the question is not the absolute level of debt so much as whether you have a plan to bring it down responsibly over time so that people can see, just as families have to make sure that in the end, they can pay their bills. Uh, they don't just max out on their credit card without having any way of repaying those debts. It's just the same for countries. And we have to do that because if we want to put more money into the NHS, uh, if we want to uh, help people who are going to find it very, very difficult this winter, then we need to have the resources to do that. And that means that we need to take difficult decisions even at moments like this. You've said that all government departments will have to find more efficiencies than planned. So is that true of every department? Well, uh, a strong public services, which we all want, need a strong eco economy. So you have to take difficult decisions. But it's also true that a strong economy needs good public services. We need, for example, the NHS to help people get back to work. So we'll approach this in a balanced way that makes sure that we do everything we can to keep the recession, if we're in one, as short as possible and get the economy growing as quickly as we can. You mentioned the NHS there. I just want to have a look at the latest figures for A&E uh, waiting times, um, because this really is um, pretty uh, stark. This is the number of people waiting more than 12 hours in A&E uh, in uh, England. Uh, 4,000, 43,000, I should say, 792 in October. I mean, Frankly, this doesn't look like a health service that can find efficiency savings. This looks like a health service that, you know, is on the brink of, of collapse. There are massive pressures in the NHS. Obviously, it's something I know very well from 
uh, previous jobs I've done. And I think that doctors, nurses on the front line are frankly under unbearable pressure. So I, I do recognise the picture you say. Um, it's also true that there is a lot of money going to the NHS and, and they will be the first to say that in a context where funding for the NHS is going up, we need to do everything we can to find efficiencies. But if you're saying to me the NHS is in a very, very tricky situation, I agree. And, you know, I care passionately about the NHS. I've spent more time thinking about the NHS than any other public service in my time in Parliament. And we need the NHS to help us get out of the economic difficulties we're in because, as you'll see in other parts of the Sunday papers, we've got a big increase in the number of people who aren't working, aren't taking part in work, even though they perhaps could. And sometimes that's as a result of long-term sickness. So the NHS is part of the solution, as well as facing some very big problems. So are you going to look at that specifically to try and, I guess, uh, look at the benefit systems, try and encourage people back to work who you believe could be working more? We need to look at all public services uh, to make sure that they're doing the right thing for the economy. Um, we need to take these difficult decisions, but we need a balanced plan. And what I want to announce to the country on Thursday is, is not just the difficult decisions, but also to show the way through. And part of that is to show that by tackling inflation early, dealing with these bills that are soaring for families up and down the country, we can get back to growing the economy healthily so that we can invest the kind of sums that we all want to in our public services. Uh, you talked at the beginning about compassion uh, and you've also said that those with the broadest shoulders should be asked to bear the greatest burden. How do you define the people with the broadest shoulders? Well, I think we have to recognise that people on the very lowest incomes only have so much they can give. We, we will be asking everyone for sacrifices, but I think in a, in a fair society, as we are in the UK, uh, we need to recognise that there's only so much you can ask from people on the very lowest income. So that will be reflected in the decisions that, that I take. And I think that's important because uh, Britain is a decent country, a fair country, a compassionate country, and I want that to be reflected in the decisions we take. So you'll be paying a bit more tax then uh, after next week? Well, we're all going to be paying a bit more tax, I'm afraid, Sophie. Um, but it's not just going to be bad news. I think what people recognise that is that if you want to give people confidence about the future, you have to be honest about the present and you have to have a plan. And this will be a plan to help bring down inflation, help control high energy prices and also get our way back to growing healthily, which is what we need so much. Do those with the broader shoulders include public sector workers uh, who are likely to be seeing real terms cuts to their pay uh, at a time when inflation is at 10%? Well, I'm very conscious of the uh, concerns, for example, of nurses um, who are considering industrial action at the moment. And if you listen to what nurses' leaders say, their concern is about the impact of inflation on their pay packet. And the point I would make, Conservatives know that uh, a thriving, dynamic economy needs low taxes and sound money. But sound money has to come first, because if you're a nurse, it's inflation that is eroding the spending power in your pay packet. It's meaning that your weekly shop is becoming much more expensive. It's meaning that mortgages are more expensive than they were. And so we need to do something that shows public sector workers, just as we show everyone, that we're getting back to a low inflation economy where they don't have to worry about bills getting higher and higher. Do you agree with the health secretary that nurses are asking for too much? Well, I think we have to recognise a difficult truth that if we gave everyone inflation-proof pay rises, inflation would stay. We wouldn't bring down inflation. And that's why, you know, I'm not pretending there aren't some difficult decisions. But what I want to say to, to nurses, to everyone, is that the way through this is to bring down inflation as quickly as possible, because that is the root cause of your concern, your anger, your frustration, that your pay isn't going as far as I it guess, might um, have. You, know, you talk about difficult decisions and, you know, and everyone being impacted, but I just wonder if that's true, because you know, according to reports, the triple lock on pensions will be protected. So pensions will be going up by 10% uh, linked to inflation. Do nurses have broader shoulders than you know, a wealthy retiree spending time on the golf course? 
Well, I think these are the questions you should ask me after I announce okay. what the decisions are next week. But um, I would say that there is a lot of pensioner poverty, a lot of pensioners in very... But the triple lock's not means-tested, though, is it? Uh, well, very often pensioners uh, need help, and it's not necessarily people on the very lowest incomes. But I think you have to wait for the decisions, and then we'll see. But I think what you'll see overall is a broad approach that recognises that where we can, we need to prioritise people on the lowest incomes. OK. Uh, now, have you, as you've acknowledged, we are most likely uh, already in a recession. Uh, you're, of course, proposing to cut spending and raise taxes, two things that can have a negative impact on growth. I just want to listen to uh, Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, this is what he told our Deputy Political Editor, uh, Sam Coates, uh, this week. If they try and hammer us too hard with tax rises, they will actually drive us deeper into recession, thus countering the right objective. And, by the way, any deficit they think is there, and by the way, these are just forecasts, would actually grow, not shrink. So they, they actually defeat the objective, which is what John Maynard Keynes told us many years ago, you don't raise taxes during a course of a recession. He's worried that you could be driving us deeper into recession. Is he right? Well... Um, I have a great deal of res respect for Ian Duncan Smith, and um, he illustrates with some very important points the very finely balanced decision we have to make, because he's absolutely right. You don't want to do things that make any recession that you may be in worse. But on the other hand, if, if you do nothing, if you don't show that we're going to bring our debt down over time, We've seen what happened before with the, the mini-budget that happened. Interest rates get higher and you get a recession that's made worse because people suddenly find the cost of their mortgages has shot through the roof. Businesses find that the cost of their loans have become much more expensive. So you need to chart a balance course that is doing the right thing to make sure that the recession that we have... By the way, um, the predicted fall in German GDP is is much greater than the fall here. So this isn't something that it's just us. Inflation is higher in Germany, uh, in, in Italy as well. So all countries are facing these challenges. But if you're saying to me, do I want to act in a way that makes this recession, if we're in it, as short and shallow as possible? Absolutely. He's not the only Conservative MP who will be concerned about, you know, growth and about uh, low taxes. I, I just want to play you a part of our interview that we did when you were running uh, to be a Conservative leader in, back in July. I mean, it feels like a lifetime ago, but it was only a few months. Uh, this is a message that you were giving then. We are where we are, and I think the priority now is to go for growth for the economy. But I also think no Conservative should raise taxes. So the cut... The, the cuts I'll make, they're not particularly retail. I'm also someone who thinks that we shouldn't just stop the corporation tax rises. I think we should cut them so that they're the lowest in Europe and North America. Uh, I want to cut it to 15%, the lowest we're able, we're allowed to cut it to, according to international agreements. Cutting taxes, going for growth, what happened to that guy? Well, he's sitting right in front of you, Sophie. <laughs> and, um, yeah, look, I actually, the overall point I was making is something that I hope you'll see reflected in the decisions made on Thursday, which is to try and protect the things that really matter for economic growth. But the world has changed since the summer. Um, we've had a very big deterioration in public finances, in the international situation. So Rishi Sunak, to be fair, was, uh, during that leadership campaign, describing as prioritising growth over inflation as fantasy economics. Well, and he deserves great credit for that, because, because he said things like that that people didn't want to hear... Uh, he lost the Conservative leadership campaign. And I think subsequent events have proved that he is absolutely right in the judgments that he made at that time. But what I would say is um, the Jeremy Hunt you saw there saying, let's be the most competitive place for businesses anywhere in Europe, is the same Jeremy Hunt that is now Chancellor of the Exchequer. And uh, we need to absolutely protect the things that matter for our long-term growth. Um, just finally... Um... You mentioned Rishi Sunak there. Of course, he used to do your job, uh, Chancellor. And um, I'm just interested to know what it is like, you know, putting together a big fiscal event like this uh, with your boss, the guy who uh, used to be Chancellor. Is it a bit like someone having someone, you know, looking over your shoulder, marking your homework for you? It's a great relief, actually, Sophie, because I've got someone who knows all the things you can do that might go wrong, all the mistakes you, you might make inadvertently. Um, so we have exactly the same approach on the big issues. Uh, we need to do what's right for long-term growth. 
We need to be prepared to take difficult decisions if necessary, but we want to protect the vulnerable. But in terms of the detail, this is someone who's done my job extremely well, and uh, that's a great support. OK, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, the Chancellor uh, speaking there ahead of his autumn statement, which we are, of course, expecting on Thursday. Well, let's turn to Labour now, shall we, and find out what they made uh, of that interview with the Chancellor. We can speak now to the Shadow Chancellor, uh, Rachel Reeves, uh, who joins us now from Leeds. Thank you very much for being uh, on the programme uh, this morning. Um, Jeremy Hunt telling me there that everyone is going to be paying a little bit more tax uh, after next week. Do you think he's got the right plan? Well, we'll see what he comes up with on Thursday, but I am determined to hold him to account for having a fair tax system. And what I would like to see on Thursday, and what I would be doing if I was Chancellor of the Exchequer, is closing some of the tax loopholes which mean today that some of the wealthiest in society and some of the uh, most uh, biggest businesses are not paying their fair share of taxes. Uh, that's why, for example, when the, ch when the Prime Minister flies off to the G20 summit today, he should be committing to closing some of those loopholes that mean big global multinationals not paying their fair share of tax. There is already a global agreement, but we haven't legislated for it here in the UK, and it could bring in £7 billion a year, as well as helping some of our smaller businesses and high street businesses. As you know, Sophie, I've been banging on about the windfall tax on big energy companies since the beginning of this year, and the Prime Minister, when he was Chancellor, slow-pedalled on that. We still think that you could raise an additional £50 billion through extending the windfall tax by uh, two years, by backdating it to the beginning of January, when those windfalls, those profits of war, started coming onto the balance sheets of the energy companies by getting rid of some of the loopholes that mean companies like Shell are not even paying any of the government's energy profits levy and extending it to some of the electricity generators. So there are fair choices that the Chancellor could be making this week rather than just putting all of that burden on ordinary working people who are already struggling with the highest inflation that any of us have experienced for 40 years and now risk more of their money going in taxes uh, rather than having it uh, for the weekly food shop, the higher mortgage payments and, and everything else that is facing people right now. Um, I take your point that Labour was, of course, the first to call for the windfall tax uh, on energy firms, but it does look like, according to reports, uh, that the government is going to be uh, extending uh, that uh, next week. Jeremy Hunt was also talking about the cost uh, 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 Sophie, uh, of... let me just say... Uh, let me just... Let me just say on a windfall tax, I hope the government does extend it, uh, but I hope they do what Labour are calling for, which is ensuring that the tax paid by energy companies here is similar to what it is in Norway, and that okay. we get rid of those loopholes that mean for more investment in fossil fuels, those energy companies can offset the windfall tax. That is not right. Companies should be paying their fair share, and that would ease the pressure on the tax burden for ordinary working people. OK, the question that I was going to ask uh, was uh, that Jeremy Hunt was also talking about the cost uh, of the energy support uh, package, saying that with the rise in energy bills, it's going to be like funding a second NHS. So I just wonder what Labour's plan is. Uh, how long do you think the energy price guarantee should last? And is there a point when actually it, it should be targeted at the most vulnerable, pensioners, those on low incomes, rather than just everybody? Well, when um, Keir Starmer and me set out our plans for the autumn and um, winter months, and we did that in August, at that time, c the Conservatives were all saying um, that they didn't believe in, in handouts. They're constantly playing catch-up with what Labour are putting forward. And, of course, the new Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, would, would reduce the support that was available to people. Now, look, we'll see where we are going into the new year and where energy uh, prices are, but Labour have always been very clear that the windfall tax on energy okay. companies should be used to try and keep bills as low as possible for pensioners, for families, and also for businesses. And, you know, I speak to many businesses, including uh, here in Leeds, and in fact, I was talking to one business owner yesterday who said that she wasn't even able to get a contract for energy, so she doesn't know from one week to the next what she's paying because she's now just on a floating uh, a deal tracking energy prices. That's incredibly difficult for her and her business because energy costs are a big part of it. So we need more certainty and clarity from the government about what is going to be available after, you, after April. 
You're not giving the certainty and clarity either, though, are you? Because I just asked, you know, firstly, if you think it should be targeted, and secondly, how long it would last for under Labour. Well, look, I, I've made this commitment that we would extend the uh, windfall tax on those big oil and gas companies. And we've always said that if you do that, there's more money to help people with their gas and electricity uh, bills. And the government have always slow pedalled on the support that is needed. It's why also Labour came up with a package for some of our most energy intensive industries who are being put at a um, comparative disadvantage compared with some of our international competitors who are being supported. And the government has okay. never come up with a package to help them. Uh, in September, you said uh, on GMB, austerity is not the right approach. We will oppose any cuts to public services. Is that still your position, that you will oppose any cuts to public services? Public services are already on their knees. Seven million people are waiting for uh, an NHS uh, operation uh, or, or support. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, if you look at our, our schools, our, our class sizes are increasing. Teachers are increasingly having to fund uh, the basics out of their own um, money. And, and so I, I, I don't believe that austerity 2.0, after the austerity that we've gone through after the last 12 years, it is the right approach, which is why I'm arguing for two things, both fairer choices on taxes, but also, crucially, a plan for growth. Because one of the reasons that we are in this mess we're in and why we have been so uniquely exposed in Britain with one of the lowest growths of any of the OECD, the major industrialised economies, is because we've just been languishing in the league tables in growth over the last decade. So we need a growth plan. It's why I've set out Labour's Green Prosperity Plan, because I genuinely believe that Britain can be a global leader in some of the industries of the future, from green hydrogen to tidal energy, floating off offshore wind, carbon capture and storage, creating good jobs in all parts of Britain, helping keep people's bills low and also boosting our energy security. It's why uh, we are set out our plans to make Britain the best place to start and grow a business and reforming business rates to help okay. our small businesses and our high streets okay. thrive. We need all of that because that's what brings in the money to pay for our public services. And the I'm problem gonna... is, now after 12 years of Conservative government, growth is on the floor and inflation okay. is going through the roof. I'm going to jump in just because I've got a couple more questions that I do want to uh, squeeze in before I have to let you go. Um, Jeremy Hunt was saying uh, on uh, public sector pay and on strikes, if we gave everyone inflation-proof pay rises, then inflation would stay. Uh, nurses are currently striking. They want an above inflation pay rise of 17%. Do you think that's affordable? I'm not going to pluck numbers out of the air. But it should be a I'm badge of shame the for the Conservatives. Well, it's up to the pay review bodies to work with the unions, but it's a badge of shame that for the first time in their history, nurses are looking to go on strike. This didn't happen when Labour was in government because we valued and respected public service workers, including those who work in our NHS, who have given so much to our country these last few years. We've got huge recruitment challenges in the NHS, including amongst nurses, uh, workload issues, issues of, of, of stress. We've got nurses that are going to food banks. So we need to support our NHS workers, including our nurses, uh, and that means uh, fair but affordable pay rises. I'm not going to uh, um, uh, cut into the, uh, the, the, the pay review negotiations that are going uh, on. But the Secretary of State for Health should meet with the nurses and the nursing unions and work out a, a, a deal and, and show some respect to these crucial public service workers. I've just got one more question to uh, squeeze in. Um, over the summer, you were pictured uh, chatting uh, to Rishi Sunak at a Bloomberg a drinks event. It was shortly before he was made Prime Minister. What were we talking about? Uh, well, we, we were at a, re at a reception and uh, I shadowed Rishi Sunak for about a, a year and a half. Uh, we were talking about a number of things, but it, it also particularly actually about our children. We've both got young children. We were talking about the uh, influence that they have on our, our politics. Um, I was also, you know, commiserating with him on, on losing the leadership contest. Uh, he did lose that contest to, to Liz Truss. Uh, he's now Prime Minister. 
but he's not willing to face the people, there should be a general election because he has no mandate. He was not chosen by either his members and certainly not by the country. There's no mandate for the cuts and the tax increases that they are putting through now. The people should have a choice about who their prime minister and who their chancellor is. That will only come through a general election and that's why we desperately need one to have a mandate okay. for the decisions that are being made in our name. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Rachel Reeves. The safe space, I feel, talk about children uh, in the political arena. Well, you were watching uh, Safe Ridge on Sunday. Uh, we've had, I think, a bit of uh, information there from uh, the Chancellor on what to expect next week. Tax rises for everyone, uh, although I wouldn't hold your breath uh, on those inflation-busting public sector uh, wage rises. Still to come on the programme this morning. In just a moment, we'll be talking to the former Leveling Up Secretary under Liz Truss, Simon Clark, the first time he's given an interview since leaving government. A little later, we'll hear from Christina McInay. I wonder what she makes uh, of the Jeremy Hunt interview. She's the boss of the UK's biggest union, Unison. Plus, we're going to be getting some immediate reaction from our deputy political editor, Sam Coates. Been watching all our interviews this morning. We are going to speak to Sam a bit later and get his take. Now, Simon Clark was one of Liz Truss's closest allies, so he had a ringside seat at the formation of the economic policy that was to bring her down. He backed Boris Johnson initially in the contest to replace her, so he was quickly out as levelling up secretary when Rishi Sunak took the top job. He's also been chief secretary to the Treasury and criticised the science of the state. So what does he want to see from the Chancellor on Thursday. Uh, thank you very much for being uh, on the programme uh, this morning, uh, Mr Clark. Uh, I'm not sure if you managed to catch any of Jeremy Hunt's uh, interview, but he did say that we can all expect to be paying a bit more tax. Do you think he's got the right approach? Uh, yes, I think it is absolutely right that we balance the books. I would urge Jeremy to make sure that we do as much as we can from spending reductions as opposed to tax increases, noting that clearly tax is at a very high level and faced with the recession risk that we all know uh, exists at the moment. I, I, I think the balance of advantage and the best pro-growth option would be to reduce spending rather than to increase taxes. But I recognise he's got an incredibly difficult job to do and he will have my support in making sure that we strike uh, an arrangement which will give the markets confidence and the country confidence that we can pay our way in the world. Uh, you say that you'd like to see the balance uh, slightly tipped in favour of spending reductions. At the same time, though, a lot of public services are already uh, under pretty deep strain, whether it's, you know, the NHS, whether it's schools, whether it's defence. Are there any areas uh, where there are more efficiency savings, if you like, to be found? Well, I, I think the main thing is, I would say, that we should protect the defence budget at a time when, obviously, the world is in turmoil, when we're seeing the effects of Putin's war, and when we know that China is keeping an eye firmly on what opportunities may exist for her with Taiwan. So I would urge him not to cut the defence budget and to stick by Liz's... 3% commitment of GDP by the end of the decade. But beyond that, I think there are areas where we can make savings. I think that our capital investment programmes are significantly overcommitted. I think there is a real issue with underspends across a lot of government because of the impact of COVID. And as a result, there is the potential there to realise tens of billions of savings without cutting crucially vital public services. Uh, at the same time, though, aren't those kind of capital pro projects quite important for growth? Well, some of them can be. I mean, obviously, some of them don't need to be necessarily cut. They can be cancelled, uh, but they can also be deferred in terms of the timescale for these projects. So it doesn't necessarily need to be the case that you uh, end them entirely, but you can say that we'll reprofile them in terms of when they will come on stream, and that offers, obviously, considerable savings potential. I think something like HS2, obviously, we've seen rail passenger numbers have not recovered to pre-pandemic levels, particularly for commuter travel. There are real questions about schemes like this, which I think ought to be addressed first before we cut things like defence, before we cut things, obviously, which really matter to the public. Uh, and I think that is the, 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 the challenge, obviously, which, that Jeremy has to face. But my, my own view is, having obviously spent uh, most of the last year as Chief Secretary of the Treasury, that the, the, the opportunity in this statement is really to reprofile our, our capital spend so that we can, we can get to a, better, a more sustainable place. I really would urge him to be very careful about cutting... Some of the things, though, which would go to the heart of our national security. 
Um, I want to talk a bit about tax rises because it was pretty clear uh, that there are going to be uh, significant tax rises uh, next week, uh, whether it's more high earners paying the 45p rate, whether it's millions of people being uh, effectively paying more tax because of freezes to income levels. Now, Ian Duncan Smith told Sky News uh, that if the government tries to hammer us too hard with tax rises, they will actually drive us deeper into recession. Do you agree with that? Well, one of the reasons, uh, clearly, that I supported Liz in the summer was that I believe very strongly that, you know, with the tax burden at a 70-year high, we need to be extremely careful about, uh, about further increasing the challenges facing businesses and households. And, uh, you know, that is something which I know Jeremy, as an entrepreneur, will be very conscious of. I I'm not saying there are easy answers here, and I certainly don't want to... Uh, uh, to, try, to, to, to sort of try and suggest that the Chancellor is, 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 is faced with, uh, with, with, with straightforward options. But what, what I do think is that we, we have throughout this exercise to be incredibly aware of just how much we've asked of both the British public and British industry over recent years. Obviously, corporation tax is going to go up from 19% to 25%. That's a, a heck of an increase. I think family budgets are obviously, as we all know, under great pressure because of the impact of the inflation arising from the war in Ukraine. I would, therefore, as I say, strongly urge that the great balance of this statement should come from spending reductions because uh, I really do think that uh, there, is, there is an issue with our raising uh, the burden of taxation on Britain at this time. Now, there's been a huge change of direction uh, since the Liz Truss administration that, of course, you were such a key uh, part of on individual policies, such as the 45p rate of tax, but also on the general philosophy as well. You know, Liz Truss wanted to borrow to fund growth. Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak are all about, you know, raising the tax burden and cutting spending in order to uh, bring down um, the deficit, even in a recession. Is there a risk, do you think, that we're now swinging too far the other way to overcompensate for what came before? Well, look, I mean, I, I think it is absolutely imperative that we restore market confidence in this country. And it's, it, is, it, is, it is right that the government uh, makes this statement this week and shows a clear path to make our, our debt sustainable. We've, we've been through an extraordinary series of events. Uh, the, the government has acted rightly uh, to make sure that we protect British households. But we have, uh, as a result, got ourselves into a, a, what is a very difficult situation and one which is obviously shared by most other uh, Western economies have also had to act uh, to protect uh, households and businesses. I do think that in this exercise we must be careful not to choke off growth. That would be my main, my main argument. I, I don't dispute the need uh, to restore market confidence. I think it's very important that we do set out a clear, a clear runway for the years ahead. But as I say, I think, I think that if, we're, if, 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 we're, if you're faced with two difficult choices, the better choice is to curb public spending. Let's not forget that government spending as a whole has risen from some 700 billion uh, in 2010 when the Conservatives came to office to over a trillion pounds today. So it has risen very substantially over the course of the last decade. There is the potential there, I believe, to make savings which don't damage public services and which fundamentally allow us to achieve the results that we need to uh, while also uh, allowing a pro-growth policy to, uh, to be delivered. Now, I've got to ask this because I feel like many people listening to you uh, will be asking you know, this question. You, you were part of the Liz Truss core team, the quad, if you like, and that was the team that effectively you know, trashed the economy. The Bank of England had to step in uh, after the budget. Uh, the Chancellor uh, was let go. The Prime Minister became the shortest serving ever Prime Minister uh, in the UK. Why should people listen to what you have to say? Well, I, I, I would reject the idea that uh, what's happened in the economy is primarily uh, the result of, what, of the actions that Liz took. The, the reality is that a third uh, of the global economy is now in recession. We are faced with extraordinary headwinds uh, coming out of uh, the situation in Ukraine, which has driven inflation to levels uh, which we haven't seen in my lifetime. That obviously comes on top of the legacy of the pandemic, not just the debt that we incurred, but also the... Uh, uh, the enormously challenging societal and economic consequences that we're still feeling. Uh, and, and, and interest rates are rising the world over as a result. I completely accept uh, that mistakes were made with the timing of the mini-budget. And whilst I take my share of responsibility as one of Liz's cabinet ministers, I, I obviously wasn't uh, directly uh, the, the, dr the driver of some of the choices that were made about whether or not to hold a new spending review, for example, which was something that I had urged during the summer and which I, I understood was the basis of the action 
that would be taken. But look, nonetheless, I do not resile from the fundamental proposition that Liz set out, which is that this economy, uh, our society as a whole, needs to become more economically dynamic more successful if we are to sustain the public services on which people rely and to pay our way in a world where, frankly, the West needs to be more competitive if we're to keep up with emerging, emerging economies. That was Liz's fundamental insight. I think it is right. I think it is very important that as the government seeks to address the undoubted challenges that the UK economy faces, that we don't do things that cut across that fundamental mission, which is that our country needs to be a successful place to operate a business, to grow uh, businesses large and small, and that that will not happen if the burden of taxation continues to increase. Um, Kwasi Kwarteng, um, the former Chancellor, of course, under Liz Truss, gave an interview this week where he says that he warned Liz Truss about going too fast. Is that your recollection of things? Well, I, I, I obviously wasn't privy to the individual uh, conversations between Liz and Kwasi, and it's, it's, it's not really for me to interpose myself into the discussion of who said what when. I have the greatest respect for both Liz and for Kwasi, and I think the way events have played out, obviously, uh, it has it, it perhaps been somewhat reductive uh, and somewhat caricatured in terms of the positions that, that were adopted. As I say, I believe there would be a full spending review to accompany... Uh, the, the tax cuts that Liz wanted to make. I think that would have been the way of showing the markets that we wanted to transition to a lower tax, more dynamic economy, but that we had a clear plan to do so linked to reductions in public spending. That uh, was certainly the position that we had discussed during the summer, and I believe it would have been a way of making Liz's fundamental mission more sustainable. Uh, and that, 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 is a, that is obviously a lasting regret uh, that I hold. But do I think, as I say, that what Liz was saying about growth remains true. I absolutely do. And I have a lot of respect for the courage that she showed in trying to move the debate onto ground, which I think is essential for the long-term health of our economy. Just finally, when was the last time you spoke to Liz Truss and how was she? Uh, well, I, I, I saw uh, Liz at the, 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 the farewell gathering that she held at uh, Chequers last month and I'm going to see her again uh, this week. But she is remarkably... Uh, resilient. She's always been exceptionally dignified and there's no, there's no self-pity there. There is obviously regret and we all share uh, regret for, for what happened and uh, you know, I, I certainly uh, continue to regard Liz as both a, a, a great colleague and a, and a good friend and someone who, as I say, I think has fundamentally got uh, her, her perspective on what this country needs to do right. Uh, we, we, we obviously all uh, have to look back and learn the lessons of what happened in the autumn, but ought the message to go out that Britain can, can, should be a high-tax, high-regulation economy, as Labour wants it to be, and that that is the route to success, I'm afraid uh, that, 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 that is not true now, it wasn't true then. And we have to be very careful that as we seek to balance the books in this country, that we do remember that competitiveness internationally is the watchword against which ultimately uh, all our actions ought to be judged. OK, thank you uh, very much uh, indeed. Simon Clark there in Teesside. Thank you. Now, as usual, the take will follow this programme. It's just after 9.30. Our chance to analyse today's interviews, talk through any news lines with our deputy political editor, uh, Sam Coates. But we can get a quick take from Sam now on what's stood out to him already uh, this morning. Uh, morning, Sam. Good to uh, see you. Uh, do you think we've got a little bit more knowledge about what to expect next week? Absolutely, Sophie. The world has changed. That's Jeremy Hunt's message to you, to the country this morning as he prepares what is clearly going to be a gruesome statement uh, that he delivers on behalf of Rishi Sunak and the government on Thursday. Interestingly, not everybody agrees, as you were just hearing from Simon Clark, senior figure from the Trust government, who worries that actually this might go too far. Uh, a huge row clearly brewing inside the Conservative Party about whether or not Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak are going to be doing the right thing with swinging tax rises and cuts to public services in the year ahead. But what really, really struck me, Sophie, about your interview with Jeremy Hunt was the sheer number of promises he was making in part. He wants a recession that, that isn't too deep. He wants to make sure that nobody cannot heat their homes. He promises help for businesses with energy bills next winter as well as this one. There's a long list of guarantees he seems to be given. How does he square that with having no money? 
OK, Sam, a uh, very good uh, question. Thank you very much for your analysis, uh, as always, and we'll speak a bit later. Now, the nation will fall silent today at 11am to remember all of those who've given their lives for this country in conflict since the First World War. The service at the Cenotaph in London will be particularly poignant because it is going to be the first led by the King since the passing of His Late Majesty, uh, the Queen. Now, our Security and Defence Editor, Deborah Haynes, spoke to the Chief of the Defence Staff, Admiral Sir Tony Radkin, for this programme. They discussed the war in Ukraine and also pressures on defence spending, but she began by asking about remembrance. I think Remembrance Sunday is always poignant. I think it's poignant for the whole nation, this special moment when we pause to reflect on the sacrifice and commitment of others to provide our freedom today. I think there's a special poignancy this year with both the loss of Her Majesty, uh, another loss of a Second World War veteran. And I also think it's poignant when we have once again the spectre of war in Europe and all that that entails, and a country that's been invaded and is fighting for its freedom. We're remembering the, um, those who gave their lives in the First and the Second World Wars, and like you said, right now, Europe has war once again on its soil. How likely is it that this could actually escalate into a, the Third World War? I think what you've seen, we're approaching now nearly nine months, is that the war is relatively contained in terms of geography. The impact of the war is enormous, that's global. The impact on food prices, the impact on millions of people and whether or not they were going to get the grain that Ukraine provides. The impact on all of us, whether it's inflation or the energy crisis. And I think those are all a reminder that even though the war itself might be relatively physically contained, what it means is millions of people that have been displaced from their country. Millions of people that are being attacked and they're losing their energy or their water doesn't work anymore. Millions of people fighting for their freedom. That's what you're seeing. And tens of thousands of people that are dying or are injured. And, and it's that reminder that these precious values of of, of freedom, of democracy, of that your territory is your own, and that when that's attacked, then the right people defend those and they fight to get them back. Now, we're talking um, just after Russia has given this order to withdraw its troops from Kherson city in the south of Ukraine. How significant is that? I think it's significant in the sense that, once again, you're seeing Russia fail. Russia's failed on all of its strategic objectives. It wanted to subjugate Ukraine. The opposite is hap has happened. We, Ukraine is fighting for its freedom. It wanted to take control of the cities. You saw that fail. It wanted to, to weaken NATO. NATO is stronger. And now you're seeing a war that inevitably, at the tactical level, has twists and turns. But you're seeing a Russia under pressure, taking desperate measures. That's why it's had to mobilise additional people. But it's, it's got to try and overcome a nation that's fighting for its freedom, a nation that we're supporting alongside lots of other international countries, whether that's cash, whether that's armament, whether that's ammunition. So your US counterpart, um, General Mark Milley, has said that the uh, withdrawal um, in Kherson could um, provide a window of opportunity for negotiations between the two sides. What do you think? I think that those windows will be determined by President Zelensky and President Putin. And, and undoubtedly, the tactical events might open those windows a little bit more. But we've got to respect that Ukraine is fighting for its territory, its future, its survival. Um, and this is a success for Ukraine, but at the same time, Ukraine continues to be attacked. Ukraine has lost ground that it needs to win back. Ukraine has got millions of people that are not living in their homes. They're either living elsewhere in Ukraine or in the rest of Europe. They've got millions of people that are suffering from the impacts of the electrical infrastructure having been attacked or the water infrastructure being attacked. It is a war crime to, to, a, to, to deliberately attack civilians and, and that's what's still going on. 
And is there any change in your assessment on the likelihood of Russia backed into a corner resorting to a nuclear strike in Ukraine? I think we've got to be really careful of, of, of reckless rhetoric where, where, where the, the, these noises are made about, about nuclear, whether it's a dirty bomb or it's a tactical nuclear weapon. We should be really careful about that language. That would be another total horrific step and we don't see that, that we're on a pathway to, 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 that, to that particular spectre. Uh, and we've also got to be really clear that if we started to go down that path, that it would lead to incredibly serious consequences, but where none of us are on that path. And Russia, I think, has tried to, to reassure in that sense, and I think we've been really clear as to how dangerous that, that particular route would be. Um, Sky News reported this week about um, claims that Russia has transported captured British NLAW anti-tank missiles, US anti-tank javelins and US Stinger anti-aircraft missiles to Iran along with loads of cash, £122 million worth in cash, um, in exchange for dozens of drones, these deadly um, Shahed drones that, they've been used, that Russia's been using in Ukraine. Were you aware of this? So I won't, I won't go into the detail of intelligence reports, but we've always been aware that when we provide some of our weaponry and it's going into a war zone, there's a risk that that weaponry might be captured. And, and so what I can offer you is that the, the technology that we're talking about is technology of 20, 30 years ago, and then that technology is used in the manufacturing process to provide the weapons of today. And, and so I, we, we're conscious that when we provide armament and support to a Ukraine that's in, in a war, then there might be some of those weapons that end up being captured, and that's taken into account when, when, when we go through our assessment as to what's going to be provided. So are you going to do anything about it if Iran is trying to develop N-laws? So, uh, we're in a constant competition with certain nations. It's very much the case with Iran. But it's, 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 a, it's a fact that when you provide your weapons to, to country X in the middle of a war, they may not necessarily stay in country X. The Chancellor is going to be giving his autumn statement on Thursday. How confident are you that defence will be protected from the impact of inflation and foreign exchange? I can't go into the detail of, of, of a, a financial state, statement that's, that's, that's going to be announced later this week. But what I can offer you is the seriousness with which the situation is being discussed. We have a Prime Minister, he's, he's been Prime Minister for just over two weeks. He's had numerous conversations with the Defence Secretary, with me, about the security situation in Europe but also the globe. But we specifically had an hour with the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, and I accompanied the Defence Secretary to talk about what would be the impact of a financial settlement and, and to the, the richness and the seriousness of that conversation, recognising that this war in Europe is part of the reason why we have the level of inflation that we have and why we have the economic pressure. And therefore, in trying to deal with the economic pressure, we need to acknowledge that at its core is this security pressure in Europe. And, and the government is, is, is having the right level of conversation to try and manage that, but also manage the security situation into the future. So that's why you're seeing a conversation about coming back to the integrated review of last year and, and, and taking time to, to assess that again. What, 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 what is working? Where, what do we want to affirm? And what might we want to adjust and, and, and recognise because of the increased aggression of Russia? We, we, we need to adjust some of the risks that we were taking and that might mean in the longer term more investment. But let's have that, that, that longer term conversation as well.
The government keeps saying there needs to be economic stability in order to have things like defence spending. Do you think they're now realising that the, there cannot be economic stability without security? <clears throat> and in terms of having security, you need, therefore, to invest fully in defence? Absolutely. And I think you saw that with last year's integrated review. An integrated review that tried to take into that account... That integrated review that's not going to be funded unless this government gives you eight billion pounds, according to the Defence Secretary himself, over the next two years. Are you going to get this eight billion pounds? So I can't, I can't, I can't go into the specifics. But, but I what can... happens if you don't get it? So again, I, I, I think it would be wrong to, to start talking about if we don't get it, then it means this, this and this. Those conversations are being had with the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. They're private conversations. I can assure you that those conversations are being had. They're the right conversations and they're being blended with what was said in last year's integrated review, what needs to be shaped for the longer term future, but also to recognise the, the immediate economic pressure the country is under, but also recognise there's a war in Europe. And that, that, that the, the seriousness of those conversations are being had and that's the assurance I can give you. Well, I'm sure they're serious, but if they don't end up with, with £8 billion for defence over the next two years, then they're meaningless. It means defence has to shrink. Would you resign if that happens? So, so we've got to wait and see what the autumn statement says. I think we've got to be really cautious of, 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 of the risk of being a bit too shrill and saying, right, if, if, if this happens, then I'm going to... You know, uh, yeah, this person's going to resign and that I I'm much more in the space of the right conversations are being had let's wait and see what the autumn statement says let's take stock then let's recognize there's a blend going on of economic pressures that have to be serviced and security pressures that have to be serviced and the right conversations are being had to allow to allow those solutions to emerge uh, Deborah Haynes there speaking to the Chief of the Defence Staff on Remembrance Sunday. Well, we heard that warning from Jeremy Hunt earlier on the programme this morning that we'll all pay a bit more tax and there will be what he calls very difficult decisions on public spending too. With nurses due to go on strike across the NHS soon and more strikes in the public sector, I can now speak to the General Secretary of the UK's biggest union, Unison, which represents more than a million public sector workers. That is Christina McEnay and she joins us now. Thank you for being uh, on the programme uh, this morning. Um, Jeremy Hunt said the NHS can find efficiencies. Is he right? Uh, I'm sure any organisation can still find an element of efficiency savings, but uh, I think it's a bit of a one of these words that, that's a bit of a red flag to many public sector workers because it so often means cuts. And that's the worry is that the NHS is basically on its knees at the moment. Uh, I've been spending the, the, the past week going around speaking to our, our members across the country, you know, some people who are paramedics and nurses and uh, theatre staff in hospitals, and I can tell you that they don't think there's much room for any efficiency savings. What they want to see is more investment in the NHS. They want to see a pay rate that actually encourages people to, to join the NHS and, crucially, to stay in the NHS. The uh, latest figures uh, that we uh, showed to Jeremy Hunt on a &E waiting time show a uh, record number of people waiting more than four hours and the number of waiting more than 12 hours was up 30%, almost 44,000. What kind of impact could spending restraint have on the NHS? Could it be dangerous? Of course it could. And what we, I mean, you've just said it yourself there. Um, waiting lists are at an all-time high. We've got um, the biggest, the highest level of public dissatisfaction with the NHS since it started. We've got 135,000 vacancies in the NHS. Uh, you know, people are waiting in ambulances outside hospitals for five, six, seven, as, as long as 10 hours. They're basically using ambulances as another room of the hospital, which is not very an efficient use of, of, of ambulances. And this will have an impact, it's already having an impact on British people and it will just only get worse. You know, when I hear politicians talk about, you know, difficult choices to be made, of course that's true. Uh, but there's also difficult choices, well, difficult things will happen if we don't make the right choices and if they don't make the right choices. And one of those will be the NHS is, is almost ready to collapse. And uh, excuse me for sounding like a conspiracy theorist, but I've heard so many people say it now. Is this a, a partly a deliberate attempt by the government to run down the NHS 
in order to turn around and say we'll have to bring in some private organisation to run it. Now, I hope that's not, and a bit of me thinks that's not what they're doing, but what they're not doing is taking the right choices about investing in our public services. And it doesn't make sense economically either, um, because we've had, we've had, what, 12 years of near enough austerity or public sector pay freezes, and what's happened? The country hasn't grown, the economy hasn't grown, uh, you know, the, the dreadful experiment that we had with um, Liz Truss, where she tried to just ramp all of that up, just showed what a bad strategy that is. And actually, if you invest in the working people of this country, if you see them as wealth generators and you actually give them decent pay, pay to be able to generate that wealth, then that makes a difference to local economies. And that's how you generate, the, you get the economy back on its feet again. I just want to come in because do you really believe that the government is deliberately trying to run the NHS down? Because I feel like there are some people in government who might find that you know, a bit offensive. I'm sure. And as I said, I, you know, I don't like to be a conspiracy theorist, but I honestly, sometimes when I go around and I see what's happening in some of our, the, the NHS, when I hear stories from people who are working, Unison members who are working as nurses, paramedics, uh, when I hear what they have to tell me, a bit of me does think, what is going on here? How can any politician allow this to happen, uh, you know, to something that is so valued by the British public? So, no, I'm not saying for definite that's what's happening, but every now and then it does enter my mind that that may be what's happening. I suspect, I, I would absolutely hope Jeremy Hunt certainly doesn't think that, given his views on the NHS. But I think sometimes to sort of blame everything on, you know, external other world affairs like Ukraine is wrong because the problems in the NHS and the social care sector were, were well known long before the Ukraine crisis happened. Uh, you know, it's not been uh, wages that are pushing up inflation. And some of the decisions that were taken just a couple of months ago by the, by the Tory government have certainly made things worse. And none of the people that I represent in Unison who do these essential public services were responsible for any of that. But they will now be the ones being told, we can't give you more money because the country's in such a state. Well, I'm sorry, but politicians have to decide where they're going to spend their money. That's what they're paid to do, is take those difficult decisions. Let's, let's talk about... Uh money um, because of course there are the pay negotiations uh, going on you know given the fact that you know as you accept money is really short in the NHS you worried that it could lead to dangerous outcomes is it really right that the Royal College of Nursing is asking for a 17 percent pay rise well that's what the Royal College are asking for and you know they've now got a yes vote in a, in a large number of uh, uh, any large parts of the NHS to take industrial action we're balloting our members, uh, over 300,000 in the NHS, who uh, our ballot closes on the 25th of November. And we're asking them to vote yes for strike action too. So we will definitely be talking and working with the Royal College of Nursing if we get a yes vote too. There aren't pay negotiations going on, I'm afraid, uh, sad to say. Uh, you know, ministers are telling us there's no more money. There's nobody sitting down to discuss this with us. And what I keep saying is a strike's not inevitable in the NHS. A strike's not inevitable anywhere. A strike is a symptom of a problem. It's not in itself the cause of a problem. And I would urge Jeremy Hunt and other government ministers to sit down with the trade unions and actually talk to us about how we can solve this. The Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, described a 17% pay rise as neither reasonable nor affordable. Is that kind of the kind of level that Unison might be asking for as well? Well, we're looking for a, an inflation-proofed pay award. I think it's really important that staff get something that actually means they can stay in, in work and look after their families at the same time. You know, the offer that, that's, that not the offer, the, the award that has been made to NHS workers in England, Wales and Northern Ireland is a £1,400 flat rate. Now, for most nurses, that represents, and most nurses and people in that professional band, if you like, we call them within the NHS, for most of them, it represents between 4 and 4.2%. Inflation is now running at well over 10%, expected to be even go as high as 12%. That cannot be right, that we're expecting these workers to continue to do their job, a very demanding job, and yet take what is an effective pay cut. And no wonder so many of them are leaving the sector. You know, they're going to take jobs elsewhere. You, you know, you look at what happens in the retail sector, 
uh, Tesco, Asda, Sainsbury's, Lidl, all they have all given their staff at least two, and in some places three pay increases this year. Now, the government, the government answer to us is always, we've implemented the pay review body report in full, and that's true. But what they could do is reconvene the pay review body to actually say to them, things have changed drastically since they took their decision to award £1,400 and actually ask them to reconsider and see what would be a fair offer to give to public sector workers and indeed NHS workers. OK, thank you very much indeed for being on the programme uh, this morning. Christina McAnay there of Unison. Thank you. Well, that is it for this week's Sophie Ridge on Sunday. But in a moment after the break, we'll be running through today's interviews and having a little talk about what we've learned with our deputy political editor, Sam Coates. Thank you very much for joining us this Sunday morning. Hello, welcome to Sophie Ridge on Sunday, the take where we take you back through the morning's interviews uh, with some analysis as well from our deputy political editor, uh, Sam uh, Coates, uh, to, who is joins us again this Sunday. Uh, good to see you, Sam. Um, it's always interesting, these interviews, isn't it, before the kind of big fiscal events, because, of course, there is a limit uh, on what the Chancellor uh, is going to say. It's very controlled. They're not going to brief anything out or, or even give too much hints about things they don't want to talk about. But I felt this morning we did get a pretty good steer uh, from where Jeremy Hunt's uh, thinking was and what to expect on uh, on Thursday. There was a lot of pitch rolling, uh, wasn't there? What did you make of it? That's right. And by concentrating actually on the principles behind what Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak are going to try and do on Thursday, Sophie Blundy, I think you, you learnt a lot in that interview. Let, let's just 
pause to look at the very, very biggest picture here, though. And, 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 and this is where I think the trouble might lie for Jeremy Hunt. Um, what happened in the last six weeks is that the British political system, the Conservative Party, ejected a prime minister because their economic policy went too far. Basically, Liz Truss wanted to borrow too much in order to promote growth. And, and I wonder whether or not the conversation after Thursday, Sophie, is whether or not Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt haven't done sort of the same thing, but in the other direction, whether or not the eye-watering kind of pain that they're going to initiate on Thursday doesn't go too far, whether it's commensurate with the size of the problem that we've got. And, and I was very struck that a very senior former cabinet minister in Liz Truss's government there sounding the warning against tax rises, against um, uh, many of the things that we expect uh, Jeremy Hunt to announce on Thursday. And, and, and this all underscores the fact that we are making, as a country, we are having a leadership of a Conservative Party and Conservative government that is zigzagging at speed with its economic policy. It's borrowing to invest one week. It is cutting to, cl uh, to cut our cloth to our means uh, the next. And, and it's no surprise that people's heads are spinning. And that very depressing, very gloomy interview with Jeremy Hunt, in which he emphasised the world has changed, so he has to bring in a lot of pain. I mean... You know, I think that will worry people, including Tory MPs. Uh, let's have a listen to uh, Jeremy Hunt at this uh, point, shall we? Sam, we'll come back to you in just a moment, but let's have a listen to uh, what Jeremy Hunt uh, said to me earlier. The world has changed since the summer. Um, we've had a very big deterioration in public finances, in the international situation. So Rishi Sunak, to be fair, was uh, during that leadership campaign describing as prioritising growth over inflation as fantasy economics. Well, and he deserves great credit for that. Because, because he said things like that that people didn't want to hear, uh, he lost the Conservative leadership campaign. And I think subsequent events have proved that he is absolutely right in the judgments that he made at that time. But what I would say is um, the Jeremy Hunt you saw there saying, let's be the most competitive place for businesses anywhere in Europe, is the same Jeremy Hunt that is now Chancellor of the Exchequer. At the same Jeremy Hunt uh, there uh, as during that leadership uh, campaign uh, interview. He says the world has changed, although, of course, uh, Rishi Sunak was uh, also uh, talking at that time about the risk of inflation uh, and saying that uh, there had to be uh, high taxes as a result. Uh, now, it, it does seem, doesn't it, uh, as though uh, the, uh, the policy certainly has uh, shifted. As Sam was saying, it's almost like giving everyone a little bit of, you know, um, of, of, of neck uh, bracing because it would come to whip, whiplash. Whiplash, that's what I was going for Scott just told me in my ear. <laughs> Um, whiplash is the word I was going for, uh, as we are spinning around trying to keep up uh, with uh, the Conservative uh, policy. Uh, because Jeremy Hunt told me uh, this morning that every one of us uh, is going to be paying higher taxes uh, after Thursday. Let's have a listen. Well, we're all going to be paying a bit more tax, I'm afraid, Sophie. Um, but it's not just going to be bad news. I think what people recognise that is that if you want to give people confidence about the future, you have to be honest about the present. And you have to have a plan. And this will be a plan to help bring down inflation, help control high energy prices, and also get our way back to growing healthily, which is what we need so much. Well, let's bring Sam uh, back in, shall we? I guess this is all about, isn't it, trying to restore that reputation for fiscal responsibility that the Conservatives have traditionally uh, enjoyed. Yes, with two sets of pain, Sophie, and it's probably important to acknowledge both there's going to be tax rises, as uh, he said there, but also big spending cuts and pressure to keep down public sector pay. Now, he's going to tell nurses, he made clear, that the reason that you can't do big public sector pay rises is because you've got to push down price rises, push down inflation. Well, it waits to see whether or not nurses and other bits of the public sector buy that argument and effectively call off some of the strikes that... Uh, nurses certainly and other bits of the public sector are talking about because now the priority is managing the economy trying to uh, avoid this sense that we had while Liz Truss was Prime Minister that actually we can't afford some of the things that she was promising and that's why we need the pain and it's really interesting to look at just how much already the political landscape has changed and I've I just got a really fascinating uh, little bit of polling here which makes clear 
uh, just where all of a sudden now we've got a new prime minister, the sort of economic challenge lies for this government and for the Labour opposition. And if you look here, this is essentially about how much uh, people trust the main political figures. So when you look at the question of managing the economy, actually Rishi Sunak beats Keir Starmer 50 percent to 39 percent. So that's a really big turnaround. It's a good result for Rishi Sunak already to be more trusted than Keir Starmer uh, on the economy. But then what about people's individual lives? Well, that's something where Rishi Sunak uh, sort of basically trails the Labour leader, 44 percent for Keir Starmer, but only 37 percent uh, for Rishi Sunak. And I think that probably reflects concerns that life is probably going to get a bit worse for people with less energy support next year, uh, squeezed to the public sector and uh, keeping down that uh, uh, public sector pay. And also fascinating this, uh, that they trust Keir Starmer more than Rishi Sunak, 43 to 38, when it comes to dealing with the energy crisis. Uh, so some danger there, Labour with a plan for a sort of nationalised energy company. Uh, the Conservatives saying they're going to massively reduce the amount of support that they're going to give to the country from next April, from next year. I expect a, a fraction of the amount of spending on keeping bills lower uh, from next year. So that energy bill is going to race up the political agenda. And on that issue, Keir Starmer is slightly best, better placed at the moment. It'll be fascinating to see how the public uh, uh, judges that element of what they've got to all deal, what we've all got to deal with next year. But a very clear message from this government. But the question is, does the public care more about managing the big picture economy or about the cost of living and themselves? And that's the difficult question for Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt. It certainly is. It'll be interesting to see if any of those uh, poll numbers change uh, after next week as well. Sam, we'll have more from you uh, after this short break. The photographs that we start with in the exhibition are the only set of uh, photographs, the only photographic record of arrival and selection of deportees to a Nazi death camp. I was pleased that the exhibition is there and people can see only, also only from the photographs what happened in that camp. Maybe, you know, they, they appreciate it more because there is lots of people who never heard of Auschwitz before. So it's a good thing that they put up this exhibition. From the minute I entered Auschwitz to I left Auschwitz, uh, it brings back such terrible memories. It's heartbreaking. When, when, when I arrived there to Auschwitz, uh, I came with my father and with my father and my mother and uh, the, the screaming and bellowing, get off the train, be quick. My father jumped off and I jumped after him. By the time I jumped off, I didn't see him anymore. He had disappeared like into thin air and I never saw him again. He was only 42 years old. A young man. I never saw him again. I, I was in Auschwitz for several, several weeks and... Uh, what we saw there, it's impossible to describe. The main photographs that have dominated our collective memory come from one single source, a, a photograph album that was found just by chance after the war, uh, immediately in the last months of the war, and uh, contains almost 200 photographs. But they are taken, as you say, by the SS. And so, to a large extent, we've been forced to share the Nazi gaze. When we look at these photographs, we're not seeing photographs taken with compassion or with empathy, but rather dehumanising photos. And the, the key effort in this exhibition is to try to rehumanise those in the photos. So we present the same images that people may have seen before, but in rather new ways. Some of them are life-size, for example. So you have a kind of new experience of witnessing where you're standing alongside the arrivals at Auschwitz. You're looking directly into their eyes and you're noticing details that the photographer never intended to capture. Welcome back to Safe Rid on Sunday. The 
take, where we take you back through the morning's interviews with some analysis from my deputy political editor, uh, Sam Coates, uh, as well. Now, we, of course, spoke to the Chancellor ahead of his big uh, autumn statement uh, this week. But we also spoke to the Leveling Up Secretary, Simon Clark, who, of course, was such a, a former, I should say, that such a key part uh, of the Liz Truss administration. And it was his first uh, interview uh, since he was sacked uh, by uh, Rishi Sunak. Now, he uh, felt wanted to give an intervention to say what he would like to see uh, next week. And it was pretty clear that he believes the burden of spending should fall more heavily uh, on public spending cuts than tax rises. So I asked him where he thought those spending cuts could be made. I think something like HS2, obviously we've seen rail passenger numbers have not recovered to pre-pandemic levels, particularly for commuter travel. There are real questions about schemes like this, which I think ought to be addressed first before we cut things like defence, before we cut things, obviously, which really matter to the public. Uh, so it does feel, doesn't it, as if there is a bit of a, a fight brewing among Conservative circles about uh, those tax rises to come. I also asked Simon Clark to what extent this trust was to blame for the current economic situation, making the point that for many of our viewers, they'll be saying, why should we listen to what you're saying? I would reject the idea that uh, what's happened in the economy is primarily uh, the result of, what, of the actions that Liz took. The, the reality is that a third uh, of the global economy is now in recession. We are faced with extraordinary headwinds uh, coming out of uh, the situation in Ukraine, which has driven inflation to levels uh, which we haven't seen in my lifetime. That obviously comes on top of the legacy of the pandemic, not just the debt that we incurred, but also the... Uh, uh, the enormously challenging societal and economic consequences that we're still feeling. Well, let's bring uh, our deputy political editor, uh, Sam Coates, uh, back. What, what did you make of Simon Clark? I mean, it's just incredible, really, in, in, in many ways. And, and, and what I'm just so struck by is just by the scale of the difference of different opinions within the Conservative Party about how to manage the economy, because he's basically warning Jeremy Hunt not to do lots and lots of the things that we expect Jeremy Hunt to do, the things that he was on your programme, the Chancellor was on your programme, barely 20 minutes before saying were, were very important for the, for the nation, warning that really you can't raise taxes. Jeremy Hunt had just said everybody's going to pay more, particularly those with the broadest shoulders. And then calling instead, if there is uh, a black hole to be filled, uh, then calling for that to come from, from cuts to, to, you know, to what he calls, and it's techie language, you know, investment budgets, capital budgets. But, but in my language, much of that is levelling up. You know, the, the, that's the money that over the next few years will go to pay for the kind of infrastructure projects that would regenerate many of the new areas that the Conservatives took for the first time at the last election. And, 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 and I think it's this massive clash of ideas. We often talk about politics as a clash of personalities. Underlying that, Sophie, is an enormous disagreement on the direction of the country. And, and yes, there was quite a lot of justification for why this isn't all Liz's fault. He was, as you pointed out, one of the sort of top four making key economic decisions, although he seemed to slightly tiptoe away from, 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 from that just when you, when you pushed him. Um, but the people who back the Liz Truss vision are still in the Conservative Party. And whether it was Simon Clock or whether that was there, it was that little bit of Ian Duncan Smith that you talked about, uh, that you showed viewers earlier, there is a group of people within the Conservative Party gearing up to oppose what Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunter are going to announce on Thursday. Now, when Rishi Sunak came in as Prime Minister all those two and a half weeks ago, a lot of people said, look, the grown-ups are back, things are going to calm down. But, but if Simon Clark is saying what Simon Clark said, and Ian Duncan Smith is saying what Ian Duncan Smith said, then it could quite quickly get quite bumpy. And that's going to be difficult if people within the Conservative Party are saying taxes are rising too much, spending is being cut too much, people's lives are going to be made more miserable than they need to be. And if that's within the Conservative Party, they're finding those viewpoints, then, 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 then how easy is it to push very difficult decisions through? It's difficult, isn't it? And as you say, you know, we used your interview with Ian Duncan Smith earlier uh, in the week as well, as uh, someone who uh, was not, you know, a Rishi Sunak uh, backer. Is, is it inevitable that after, you know, the, the bitterness that we've seen of two almost back-to-back -back leadership contests uh, and all of the bad blood that that uh, causes, uh, that you're going to end up having uh, these people who are clearly making interventions uh, before the autumn statement to try and swing 
the Chancellor one way or the other? Of course, it's not all happy families inside the Conservative Party. And people who suggested otherwise on the arrival of um, Rishi Sunak are sort of talking nonsense. The levels of distrust, dislike, and in some cases hatred within the Conservative Party haven't just been ironed away. There was an incredibly nasty leadership contest and, and those fissures are still visible, whether it's about economic policy, as we've been talking about today, or whether it's that massive political story that we were talking about at the beginning of the week, which was the, the, the departure of Gavin Williamson. Yet, yes, all of that was about his completely unacceptable messages. Um, there were genuine, uh, real allegations of, uh, of bullying there and he decided to stand down. But there was another layer to it, Sophie, which is people within the Conservative Party who aren't massive fans of Rishi Sunak's administration trying to wind things up to make his position worse, to pick on Gavin Williamson uh, and get him out the door. And, 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 and that's the kind of low-level infighting that's still going on at the moment. It shows that not everything uh, has particularly been solved, that it's not uh, uh, all smooth under, un, under the surface. And I, think, and I think people sometimes forget it, and I do wonder whether... It's this statement on Thursday that, again, just unpicks everything a bit more, or whether it's the trial of Boris Johnson, the, the televised hearings into whether he lied that starts to unpick the fabric of this party, uh, or whether it's something else. But, 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 but there's, there, there are warriors under the surface, behind the scenes, uh, very happy to, to, to be disruptive, because those emotions and those differences, those policy differences, are still so incredibly live and it is just really still quite fractious. Sam, I've got a quick question for you. I was actually going to ask this to Jeremy Hunt, but I ran out of time, so I'm going to ask you it instead, OK? Um, we've been, <laughs> we're taking all this at face value, right? Spending cuts, tax rises. Are these all a fantasy? Are they all going to come in in a few years' time, after the election, after things improved? Is it actually real? Or do you think it's just trying to calm the markets in the short term? If this plan survived to the other side of an election, I'm a banana. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much, uh, Sam Coates. Uh, uh, there you go. That is it uh, from Sophie Ridge on Sunday, the take uh, this morning and the programme as well. Really busy show uh, for us uh, today. The podcast is going to be following uh, around lunchtime. We'll be joined by The Telegraph's uh, Chris Hope. We'll also be presenting a coverage, of course, on Thursday uh, of the all-important autumn statements. And on Wednesday night, hope you'll join us as well uh, for the take. It is going to be another absolutely bumper, critical, excruciating week in British politics. So.